tonight's summer-long airport chaos lands the Minister of Transport in the hot seat. Just have I, am, of... I am committed to doing everything we can to address these issues. But there were warnings. I hate to say I told you so, but I told you so. Also tonight, why a promised made in Canada COVID vaccine is nowhere in sight. Was it too ambitious? This is for me the big question. And words of honor for Canadians who died in the Dieppe raid from one who survived it. They shall grow not old, that we are left to grow old. Keeping the memory alive 80 years later. This is the Nash. Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansing. After a summer of long lines at airports, delays and cancellations, there were demands for accountability in Ottawa today. It was scenes like these earlier in the summer that had the federal transport minister under fire today. Over how the situation at airports got so bad and what he and his government have done to try to fix it. Paige Parsons now and where things stand at this point in a turbulent summer and how the government is responding. Flight delays and cancellations, lost baggage, and people sleeping on airport floors. There have been horrific stories in the media that have been unacceptable. The federal transport minister acknowledges the situation at some Canadian airports this summer has been rough. Does the minister believe that the government bears any responsibility? In Omar El Gabra was grilled by MPs about the federal government's response to protect passengers. Your government brought in with great fanfare the passenger Air Passenger Bill of Rights, or the APPR which was supposed to have air passengers' backs. Now, can you tell me with a straight face that those regulations have protected air passengers over the past year? Earlier this summer, more than half of the flights out of Toronto Pearson Airport were late. For a time, the world's worst for delays, according to flight tracking company FlightAware. As of this week, it's still the world's second worst. We know that travel has not been easy for passengers. Government and industry players say things are getting better, but some critics say the chaos could have been avoided. It's not an industry where you can click the light off. In January 2021, Tim Perry warned the Federal Transport Committee that the government needed a plan. I hate to say I told you so, but I told you so. He says a lot of staff laid off early in the pandemic never came back. Hiring is happening, but in a complex industry, staffing up takes time. I think now, People realize that this is a significant issue and it has everybody's attention. For travelers like Jordan Canner, who got caught up in the chaos, there's been little recourse. She just said, I don't know, pilot didn't show up and that was it. He lost a day of his vacation because of a cancelled flight. But his complaints to the airline and compensation claims to the Canadian Transportation Agency have gone unanswered. Feels like a bit of a stretch to to blame everything on on COVID or, you know, the the extra travel that's been going on, they, it feels like they should have been better prepared. And Paige, there was also talk at today's meeting about the Arrive Can app with the Transport Minister facing criticism over that. That's right, Ian. Opposition MPs put it to the minister today that Arrive Can is causing delays at security. And there were also accusations that it's glitchy and that there have been privacy concerns. Some are calling for it to be scrapped, but the minister was very clear. He thinks the app is making travel less complicated, and he defended Canada continuing to use it. Earlier this summer, the government said the ArriveCan app will remain in use until at least September 30th. All right, Paige, thank you. Tonight, there's an urgent warning about a security flaw that could allow hackers to take complete control of your Apple devices. This bug affects iPhones, iPads, iPods, and computers. But as Nisha Patel shows us, there is a simple fix. Everywhere you turn, someone's using an Apple product. More than half the smartphones sold in Canada are iPhones. Now news Apple devices could be hacked is putting a spotlight on security. And I don't want anybody to hack into any of my like bank accounts or any social media. That sounds a little scary. Apple releases several software updates a year to keep its products secure. This latest flaw is getting more attention because of how users could be vulnerable. If it's exploited and essentially malware gets embedded, it gives the hacker or the individual control over the entire person's device. With so much of our lives on our devices, it could put a lot of information in the wrong hands. GPS 
uh, microphone, camera, very sensitive information, um, pictures, videos that you may have. The security flaw affects many Apple products, the iPhone 6S, and any later models. Versions of the iPad Air, iPad Mini, and iPad Pro, as well as some iPod Touch and Mac computers. Experts say users who let their software lag are most at risk. But about 18% of all devices globally are, you know, don't always have the latest patches and are about three versions behind. So this is where the threat actors are, are targeting those devices. Here's how to update. On your device, go to Settings. Scroll to General. Press Software Update, then hit Download and Install. Experts say not taking action could have serious consequences. They could potentially do things without you even noticing. This, this is really one of the dangers of having a device that is compromised. Apple has built its reputation on security, but the company won't say much about this flaw or how many customers could be affected. You pay pretty much a lot of money to have an Apple product, so the safety is kind of important to me. Still, it's up to users to make sure devices are up to date. A minor inconvenience to avoid a major security problem. Nisha Patel, CBC News, Toronto. Bell Media, the parent company of CTV News, is launching an independent review of its newsroom. This announcement coming amid criticism over the dismissal of Lisa Laflamme as chief anchor. The company says CTV regrets the way in which the news of her departure has been communicated, adding it may have left viewers with the wrong impression about how CTV regards Lisa and her remarkable career. Laflamme's departure and her replacement were announced on the same day. In a video posted to Twitter, Lisa Laflamme said she felt Today, blindsided by the decision sure to terminate her contract. That video has been viewed more than four million times. Well, today, Health Canada approved the use of the Pfizer COVID vaccine as a booster dose for children aged 5 to 11. This booster dose provides a great option to restore protection for this age group, especially for those who are at high risk of severe illness. New guidelines from the National Advisory Committee on Immunization recommends the booster shot for children with underlying conditions that put them at high risk for severe illness. For all others, 5 to 11, the booster can be offered six months after they complete their first series of vaccinations. Now let's check in on the Prime Minister's promise to make Canada more self-sufficient when it comes to vaccines. A richly funded plant in Montreal was supposed to be in production a year ago. J.P. Tasker shows us how reality got in the way. The government poured nearly $200 million into this Montreal plant, part of the Prime Minister's pledge to make COVID-19 vaccines in Canada and reduce the country's reliance on foreign sources. This funding will increase this facility's ability to manufacture vaccines and will strengthen the NRC's partnerships with vaccine developers. We expect the facility to be up and running by mid-2021. But it wasn't. Construction went ahead as planned. Workers hurried to meet the government's aggressive timeline. But even once it's built, a plant like this goes through a lengthy approvals process by regulators like Health Canada. And two years after Justin Trudeau's pitch, the factory sits idle. It hasn't produced a single vial of vaccine. Uh, there was this real feeling of emergency situation. Experts say the promise to build a high-tech factory from scratch in less than a year was unrealistic from the start. We knew that the, the facility would not be ready by before the end of 2021 for sure, but we needed to be ambitious uh, at the time. Was it too ambitious? This is, for me, the big question. Some voices say yes. The National Research Council told CBC News the Biologics Manufacturing Centre recently got the green light from Health Canada to start operations. Now we've learned the lessons from COVID-19. We need, you know, we need to be more prepared, better prepared. But there's another holdup. The company that signed on to make these vaccines also isn't prepared. In a statement, Novavax said it continues to work with the NRC to complete the tech transfer of our COVID-19 vaccine. But it doesn't have the ingredients, approvals or staff to start. There's little chance the Montreal facility will be pumping out vaccines anytime soon, meaning if Canada needs new shots tailored to the Omicron variant, it will again have to turn to foreign sources. J.P. Tasker, CBC News, Ottawa. Canadian Cardinal Mark Ouellette today denied allegations of sexual assault made by a Quebec woman. 
In a statement published by Vatican News, the Cardinal said, I firmly deny having made inappropriate gestures on her person, and I consider the interpretation and dissemination of these accusations as sexual assaults to be defamatory. This week, Willette was named in a class action lawsuit against the Quebec Archdiocese. Yesterday, the Vatican says there was insufficient evidence to warrant further investigation into the woman's allegations. Lawyer Michelle Obonsawin has made history as the first Indigenous nominee to the Supreme Court of Canada. Justin Trudeau made the announcement today, noting she's a fully bilingual Franco Ontarian. Karen Paul shows us many are cheering this decision, but not all. Catch me crying in my office on a Friday morning. This Indigenous law student took to social media to express her delight over Michelle Obonsawin's nomination. We now have someone who holds an Indigenous worldview and perspective who will decide on legally ground, groundbreaking cases. Incredible. My hope is that this does something to restore at least some semblance of uh, confidence for Indigenous people who are going through the justice system. Obonsawin has said her experience as an Indigenous woman shapes her life and career. In a video last year, she recalled a eureka moment during a lecture at law school. And someone in the crowd had asked him, well, what's the perfect judge? And he said the perfect judge is an Aboriginal bilingual woman. I thought, hey, that's me. Former judge, senator and chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Marie Sinclair, congratulated her, saying Obonsawin will be able to shape decisions for years to come. But this criminal defense lawyer questions her nomination. Was this the strongest candidate put before Justin Trudeau? Ari Goldkind finds it astonishing and political. Why are we now in a situation where the most important thing to deciding who sits on the highest court in the land is which demographic checkbox you occupy? Obonsawin, he said, would replace Justice Michael Moldaver, who brought a depth of experience and expertise in criminal law. That's a fair criticism. And frankly, there are very few people in the country as accomplished in criminal law as, as Michael Moldaver. So. But this former Supreme Court clerk says an Indigenous woman from northern Ontario will bring diversity and a grassroots perspective. You always try to strive to, to seek a representative court. So what happens next? There will be parliamentary hearings, but experts say there's no chance Obonsawin's nomination will be rejected because ultimately the Prime Minister has the power to appoint her. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Winnipeg. Today is the 80th anniversary of the Dieppe Raid, Canada's first major battle of the Second World War and the deadliest. Canadian soldiers led the assault on a port in German-occupied France more than 900 Canadians were killed. Ceremonies in this country mark the anniversary. A national memorial ceremony took place at Dieppe Gardens in Windsor, Ontario. Veteran John L. Date attended. He's one of the very few Dieppe Raid soldiers still alive today. And the campaign is still very much remembered overseas. In France, another Dieppe veteran was honored today. Katie Nicholson introduces us to him and to the legacies of those no longer with us. We are honored today to have with us Mr. Gordon Fennell, veteran of the Dieppe Raid. The last time Gordon Fennell was in Dieppe, he barely made it out alive. They shall grow not old as we are left to grow old. 80 years later, no longer surrounded by the enemy, but by adoration, awarded France's highest honour and the medal of the city of Dieppe. I would like you also to remark how pleased I was personally to see the, all the growth uh, taking place in that terrible day. It was the horrors of that morning which kept him from returning. I remember chiefly it was... Pandemonium. I felt that I'd had quite enough on the day of the event. And I wasn't so anxious to get back. Fennel escaped German capture in a leaky boat. So many others weren't so lucky. Up at usual time and fairly active with last minute preparations. Everyone cheerful. John Bellier never got to meet his grandfather until he found this diary 20 years ago. 
hidden away at his grandmother's. My mother did not even know that this existed, so all of a sudden we had in our hands um, something that was not only very personal, but, uh, but a record uh, of his time leading up to virtually the day before um, he was killed. A living memory, a bridge to the past. So this almost brought him to life. They live on, too, in connections between families. As prisoners of war in Poland, Linny Brown's father carried Paul Swatzel's grandfather when he broke his ankle. If it wasn't for her father, my grandfather would have been killed, probably shot and left, left on the, you know, to die. Um, and they were best friends after that. Today, they walk together along the same beach where the men were captured. My father passed away in 1975. He'd be thrilled especially with his grandson, who he never met, so he would be thrilled. There may be few who survived this raid still alive, but even after 80 years, their legacy is finding ways to live on. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Dieppe. And we'll have more coverage on the Dieppe raid anniversary. There's a new project to keep veterans' memories alive for Canadians via the mail. That's later on The National. A Shanghai court is sentenced a Chinese-Canadian billionaire to 13 years in prison for financial offenses. Shi Yao Qianhua was convicted of misusing billions of dollars controlled by his company, Tomorrow Group. He was also convicted of offering bribes to officials. Shi Yao was last seen in Hong Kong in 2017. It's believed that Chinese officials took him to the mainland. The Canadian government says diplomats were blocked from attending his trial in July. A British ISIS fighter was sentenced to life in prison in the U.S. today. Al-Shafi al-Sheikh was part of a notorious terror cell that took several Westerners hostage a decade ago. They killed four Americans. Al-Sheikh was given eight concurrent life sentences with no chance of parole. His terror cell was known as the Beatles because of their British accents. Outrage is building in India over the early release of 11 men convicted of murder and gang rape. 20 years ago, they attacked a Muslim woman during deadly religious riots. Salima Shibji shows us the reaction in the streets, beginning in Delhi. The anger courses through the protest on a Delhi roadside. The women hear outrage that 11 men convicted of a brutal gang rape and multiple counts of murder had been released from jail early. Justice has been snatched from the victim, this protester says. Despite the public outrage. And the government is silent. How could they be released, this woman asks, when they got life sentences? The men were convicted in 2008, six years after their crimes, committed in the midst of deadly religious riots that gripped Gujarat 20 years ago. In a mere three days, more than a thousand people died, most of them Muslim. Bilkis Bano, then 19 years old and five months pregnant, was repeatedly raped and left for dead. Her three-year-old and other family members killed in front of her. Now her attackers are free, given sweets and a hero's welcome, as they got out of prison earlier this week. Bano, devastated, said in a statement that she was bereft of words and still numb at the verdict. How can justice for any woman end like this, she wrote. That question also being asked at this food stand on the streets of Mumbai. Why? How? When I read the newspaper the other day, I had tears in my eyes. I could just feel the pain. I think it's injustice. The decision to release the men came from the Gujarat state government, a unanimous ruling from a panel that included several politicians from the ruling BJP party, one of whom justified the move in a way that angered many. They displayed good behavior in jail, he tells a local media outlet. They were brought up with strong values. They're Brahmins from the highest Hindu caste. Those comments chilling for Flavia Agnes, a longtime women's rights advocate and lawyer. The message that is being sent out is frightening. That the case is political, she says, first and, and, and foremost. If you belong to a particular party, then there will be mercy for you. Trust in the justice system shattered. Many women in the country left with little hope that the punishment for rape and murder is strong enough. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Mumbai. At least 12 people are dead in Central and Southern Europe after a series of violent storms. 
This was Thursday on the French island of Corsica. Several people there killed by falling trees after hurricane force winds hammered the island. Deaths were also reported in Italy and Austria. Now to Alberta, where the Calgary Flames have just completed one of the most remarkable comebacks in the NHL. Within weeks, the team has gone from losing two superstars that shook the confidence of fans to a blockbuster trade and a surprise free agent signing. Aaron Collins now on a roller coaster of a summer for a team and its city. From the highest of highs, a series win in overtime. Game five, and McDavid scores! To the lowest of lows, losing in the Battle of Alberta. The Calgary Flames season had its ups and downs, but it's nothing compared to the team's off season. First, the team's biggest star, Johnny Gaudreau, left in free agency. Then his line mate and the team's second highest scorer said he wanted out too. Both star American players looking to play closer to home. A nightmare scenario for the team's general manager. You can curl up and, and play woe is me and poor me, or you can, you know, you dust yourself off and, and you get after it. A Brad Tree Living did more than try, quickly flipping Matthew Kachuk to the Florida Panthers, snagging two Canadian stars in return. Jonathan Huberto was quickly signed long-term. Defenseman Mackenzie Weger says he'd like to stay too. Then this week, the Flames landed top free agent Nazem Kadri, a trio of Canadians committed to playing in Calgary. I'm a Canadian boy. I uh, love the, the country of Canada, love the city of Calgary. A remarkable turnaround that hasn't gone unnoticed by hockey fans on both sides of the Battle of Alberta. It was terrifying for a good bit there. Did not know what the season was going to look like, but it looks amazing now. I can't wait. I don't know. I think Oilers are still going to be better this year. Yeah. Averting an on-ice disaster matters for a franchise looking for financial help to build a new arena after a deal with the city fell apart. If you're going to try and extort um, public funds for that arena, then you absolutely need to have a winner on the ice. So it's been a remarkable turnaround for the Flames this offseason, at least in theory. Of course, it's still just August, and this version of the team hasn't won anything yet. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. A rise in the cost of living has left some parents struggling with back-to-school shopping. I just don't have as much money to go around. Um, it's it's that much harder. Up next, tips on adapting to a new financial reality. Plus, honoring a team 70 years after they left the field. We want to thank the Canadians for letting us be part of their history. It's a tremendous honor. Why African American baseball players made the move to Saskatchewan in the 1950s, and why two former players returned this summer. And later, catching up with the team pilot on his journey to a world record. I've been in planes my whole life. We're back in two. As kids get ready to go back to school, parents are on the lookout for school supplies. But the recent jump in inflation is making that ritual harder for many this year. Deanna Sumanag Johnson looks at the choices that many families are making. All right, let's see it. Single mom Monica Bellier is doing an inventory of her kids' school supplies. Maddie, can you make do with this binder for next year? Normally, she says she'd just get them new things, but finances are tighter this year. It's like all this stuff happens at one time, and especially now that, you know, I just don't have as much money to go around, um, it's... It's that much harder. Do you even have any pens? Do you use pens? She's not the only parent stressed out about it. A major survey of U.S. consumers by Deloitte found that more than half of back-to-school shoppers surveyed are concerned about inflation. Salvation Army says the demand is way up for its backpack program. Donated backpacks filled with school supplies. In some places, double last year's demand. What families we talk to have told us is even spending the same can feel like spending more these days. Not all these items are necessarily much more expensive than last year. It's just that with food and gas prices so high, families have less money to go around for any additional expenses. They'll shop at consignment stores uh, for clothing. This financial expert says planning is key to cutting costs. You want to spread out the shopping over time, over months if you can. All the clothing, for example, will go on sale in late September. 
Maybe you can hold off on big ticket tech items until say Black Friday or Cyber Monday. Another thing she says families should do is talk to their kids about finances. This Winnipeg family who immigrated from Nigeria last year are living off only one income for now. Money is tight, but this father says it's also a teachable moment. We needed to begin to let the, children, let the kids know uh, the importance of saving costs, like saving money. So, <laughs> so it's, it's even a, a, a time that actually uh, has been helping us as a family to be more disciplined in terms of our expenses. It looks good. Families having talked to their kids about the pandemic now have other lessons to share before school even starts. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. The last wolf missing from a Vancouver zoo has been found safe and has been returned to its pack. This discovery ends a three-day search and rescue operation. Earlier this week, nine wolves escaped from the Greater Vancouver Zoo after their fence was deliberately cut. One of the animals was found dead on a nearby road. All the others have now been accounted for. The RCMP is investigating. Up next, celebrating Saskatchewan's all-black baseball team 70 years later. The Canadians were extremely polite, friendly, supportive. We had a pretty good baseball team. How the Indian head rockets broke racial barriers and brought people together. And later, why some Canadians were receiving a postcard connecting them to the Dieppe raid. This summer, Saskatchewan is celebrating its baseball history and the legacy of barrier-breaking players who found a way to play in the face of discrimination and racism. It's been 70 years since the Indian Head Rockets hit the field, but as Dan Plaster shows us, they still have a lot of fans. The distance now, it seems far, far away, but when we were younger, this little distance didn't seem as, as far. <laughs> At 90 years old, Willie Reed and Nat Bates move a lot slower these days, but they clearly remember their glory days on the baseball field. I enjoyed turning the double play. They've been friends since middle school and have lived in Richmond, California for most of their lives. Uh, ooh. But still reminisce about a time seven decades ago when they moved north to play baseball on an all-black team. It was July 1st, 1952. The town of Indian Head, Saskatchewan was celebrating its 50th anniversary. The main event was dubbed Canada's Greatest Baseball Tournament. It attracted thousands of fans. And on the mound for the Indian Head Rockets was a young black man from California, Nat Bates. Behind him at second base was one of his best friends, Willie Reed. That seemed like a time of great opportunity for them. We were young and, and uh, eager to uh, explore and go up there and play baseball because we had an uh, inkling of uh, being in the majors later on in life and so forth. And we figured that would be a good experience. Uh, the Canadians were extremely polite, friendly, supportive. We had a pretty good baseball team and uh, we generally fill the stands wherever we uh, play. Jackie Robinson singles the center. Up until the 1940s, baseball had been racially segregated. Then in 1947, Jackie Robinson became the first African American to play in the majors. There was no longer a need for the all black Negro National League, and it quickly folded, leaving hundreds of black professional ball players without a place to play. Most ended up on barnstorming teams touring across America. Nat and Willie made their way up to Saskatchewan after the Jacksonville Eagles moved to Canada and became the Indian Head Rockets. It's a new adventure. I don't think the players, my co-players, were, you know, fearful. Coming from the United States, uh, where right after the war we had experienced a lot of racism uh, in housing, and just in a personal relationship. But in Canada, the only thing that you might call racial, but it wasn't, is that they referred African Americans as darkies. Good morning, darkie. You know, that kind of thing. There were black players on teams all across the prairies, 
But while these American and Cuban players who visited Canada in the 1940s and 50s were celebrated, black Canadian players still faced barriers. Professor Ornella Inzi and Duki Yimana studies the experience of black athletes in Canada. We do have sort of that, that dissonance where black Canadians who are from here, who are living here, um, very much recognize that, that, that um, it's a complex place to, to live. You never know where you stand. This summer, the town of Indian Head is taking its own trip down memory lane. The local museum opened up an exhibit honoring the Rockets and what they meant to the community during the 1950s. Leon Farrell's father ran the team. Pretty exciting. You know, I remember going to the games and cheering like mad. Max Weeder is a baseball historian originally from Saskatchewan. He says these all-black teams in prairie towns brought together people from different worlds at a time when racial integration was gaining momentum. That role uh, it, it played uh, in exposing people in Indian Head, people across the prairies to people of different cultures. Uh, uh, and I think that was certainly important. Um, and it's important, I think, that we remember so much more history than we do. The induction to the Saskatchewan Baseball Hall of Fame means a lot to Nat and Willie. We want to thank the Canadians for letting us be part of their history. It's a tremendous honor. For these two longtime friends and for the town they represented, their old team still holds a special place in their hearts. Dan Plaster, CBC News, Indian Head, Saskatchewan. Still ahead as Ontario unveils its plan to fix the crisis in long-term care, we revisit one nursing home's very different approach. What's the secret here? So we have fewer elders in house. What Canadian long-term care homes can learn from a model south of the border. Next. Even before the pandemic, much of Canada's long-term care was in crisis. In Ontario alone, about 39,000 people are on the wait list for a spot. This week, the province laid out a temporary plan to ease the pressure by moving elderly patients to facilities outside of their communities. Longer term, the government says it's working to create more beds, but will they build back better? Last December, David Common showed us a model of nursing home success where the emphasis is on home. Hey, Mary, I'm going to do your hair, and then we're going to go get some breakfast. You hungry? Oh, yeah, I'm always hungry. Okay. It's mid-morning outside Toledo, Ohio, and Mary Nicodemus is just getting up. I like coffee. She loves her coffee. Okay, come on, let's go get something to eat. She's one of only 10 residents in this nursing home, which is redefining what these homes look like. Dina Webb is a caregiver here. Your spot. Oh, my. Like, I just think of some of the other long-term care facilities I've been in Canada, mm -hmm. and it's not like this. Everybody gets up like a conveyor belt at the same time. They get woken up, they get showered, they get dressed, and then get brought to, to dinner, and it's dozens of people. This is very different. Yes, um, I used to work in a facility like that. You have more time to spend with the elders. So it's not like traditional. Everybody got to get up at this time. Everybody got to lay down at that time because everybody is different. Mm -hmm. And it recognizes that. Mm -hmm. Another big difference, there isn't some mass kitchen cooking for hundreds, just Dina and another caregiver collaborating each week with the elders on a menu. Now with Mary, she's not picky with food. Some of them are, and we do make them accordingly what they like. For instance, Jenny don't like eggs, so we gave her waffles. But Mary, she will eat whatever you give her. With a smaller home, it also doesn't take long for staff to respond. When Mariah Jones's pager goes off, it's Jenny Eitner asking for help to get into her chair. Yes. Hi, Jenny. And unlike thousands of seniors in Ontario, Jenny doesn't share this room with anyone. I have my own room. I can do it any way I want it. And I have my own bathroom. I feel comfortable here. Most of the girls know who you are. And Dina knows what you like, what you don't like. Would that happen in a bigger long-term no. care home? No. What's the secret here? So we have 
fewer elders in a house. In our elder assistants, we have two that work in a house. They really get to know our elders. Tammy Allison is in charge here. Shirley, here's your water, your Thank ice you water. But there are fewer managers than at other homes. The money focused instead on frontline care. The concept far less top down than many homes in Canada. You might find yourself involved in laundry or serving food or helping with food preparation or just sitting down and chatting with somebody. Done all of those this week already. So yeah, just wherever the need is. The outer assistants know they can call me and say, hey, I need some help. And you know, they can call any of our leadership team mm -hmm. and we'll be right there. I don't spend my day in an office. It really truly does feel like a family. We all just kind of jump in and work together. This concept of care called greenhouse model homes has had neighborhoods like this across the U.S. for 17 years, including this not-for-profit facility, which looks like a subdivision. It's run by Otterbein Senior Lifestyle Choices. Jill Wilson is the president and CEO. We call it the liberation at Otterbein. What are you liberating from? So we're actually liberating from this notion that people who need care and support and are older have to give up a home. But even Jill thought having fewer residents in smaller homes with just as many staff was unworkable at first. When her then boss told her to move entirely to this model, she pushed back. And he immediately turns red, right? He immediately turns red and he said, no, we're not going to talk about it. We're going to do it. Do you hear me? We're going to do this. Now you get your butt down to Tupelo, Mississippi and look at it and come back because you're going to do it. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so I went down to Mississippi and I walked in to a house and the first thing I said to myself, I mean, this most selfish thing I said, I could do this. If I needed to be in a nursing home, I could be here. She was convinced right away, but Jill also knew the concept couldn't cost radically more than other homes. So this isn't just a place for the wealthy. This is a place that is affordable. Yeah, well, and most of the folks here uh, have, no, have no money. Yeah, and are um, on some sort of government yes, supported on, program. Yes, on Medicaid, yeah. on Medicaid. But is, is Medicaid paying way more than they would at an institution? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, because, no, absolutely not. And there is a difference in care. On average, Ontario seniors get fewer than three hours of direct care a day. In homes like this, it's almost double. But no matter how attentive the care, no home is perfect. Caring for people with complex health concerns is challenging. Even this one has had citations for deficiencies. And the fact remains that most hope to avoid spending the last years of their lives in a nursing home. The decision hard on families. Helen Anson, who's almost 90, lived with her daughter Sue McCluskey until about seven years ago when it became too much. It's a big step when you put a loved one in a nursing home. It was tough to make this decision, but after I came in here and felt warm and invited, um, we knew that this was the right move for her. And Helen was reluctant too, no. but convinced once she visited. This is not institutional. Institutional rules are different. And you could go to bed anytime you want to. And it was more homey, the table with people sitting there, chewing and chatting. Yeah. And that really caught my eye. Especially during COVID. With smaller homes, less turnover of staff, and only private rooms, Greenhouse had significantly fewer COVID cases and deaths compared to other American nursing homes. Did you have some comfort knowing that she was here? <laughs> Very comforted by that she was in a smaller facility that um, was following protocols, very, very careful. Does this feel like home? Closest, yes. As Ontario now embarks on a massive effort to expand long-term care, homes like this show you don't have to follow the past, that this could be a model of the future. David Common, CBC News, Toledo, Ohio. When we come back, keeping the memories of Canadian soldiers alive with a postcard from the past. Chills.
like just gives you chills and makes you appreciate what you have. How a new project is connecting Canadians to soldiers who were killed in the Dieppe raid thanks to a shared home address. The head of NATO is coming to Canada next week. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg will visit Alberta and Nunavut from August 24th to the 26th. He'll meet with the Prime Minister to discuss global challenges, including Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Stoltenberg will also make a stop at a military base in Alberta to talk about Canada's contributions to NATO. And as this country marks the 80th anniversary of the Canadian-led Dieppe raid, very few surviving soldiers remain. A new project aims to keep their memory alive. Postcards sent to the Canadian homes where those soldiers once lived, each with a message about a life lost in that bloody battle. Emily Brass has the story. It's in the Hartney uh, Cemetery, and there's a memorial. This little album is how Gordon Newton remembers his uncle. Corporal Eldon Hatch was killed 80 years ago today during the Dieppe raid. He and his sister Nora say he was a handsome man who sang in the choir and loved children. We'd grab a hold and tease us and, and throw us in the air and hug us. He was a very giving, caring person, very involved with people, and, and, uh, and, and we loved him very much. <laughs> They remember their grandmother getting the news by telegram. I was a little guy. I'm sure I cried. Well, we all cried. <laughs> you know? Yeah, we all and, cried. And uh, yeah. I missed him like heck. Their uncle's last known address was here on Lincoln Avenue in Winnipeg. It's one of hundreds of homes across Canada to be sent a postcard like this. A new exhibit aims to keep memories of Dieppe soldiers alive. And we thought, well, if we can tie a serviceman who was killed overseas in 1942 to a current address, maybe that gives, you know, the person at that address, you know, a little bit of a pause on Friday to think about, you know, who was that person. Another postcard was sent to this home on Spence Street. The room that I sleep in, that could have been his room. Kathy Fawson wants to learn more about the fallen soldier who once lived in her house. Chills. Like, just gives you chills and makes you appreciate what you have and what others sacrifice you could have, the freedoms that we actually have today. Historians couldn't find a photo of Sergeant Nestor Parent, but they do have a picture of what his life was like and the horrible way it came to an end. Parent left his Winnipeg home after his parents died and enlisted with Les Fusiliers Montréal. The regiment suffered some of the highest casualties at Dieppe. Witnesses saw Parent crawling on the beach where he was fatally shot by the Nazis. Gordon and Nora hope the stories remind Canadians of the horrors of war. If you look at the news today, the actors changed, the positions changed, the issues changed but we can't seem to learn to get along together. We live in a wonderful country and it was, uh, and people sacrificed their li lives to make it that way. People like their beloved uncle, Elton. Emily Brass, CBC News, Winnipeg. It is. After the break, he's been flying planes for years and he is only 17. When I was about seven, I, I think it's the first time I actually held the controls of an airplane. You're almost there, keep going. One team's record-breaking journey around the world. This is Mac Rutherford, 17-year-old, about a week away from becoming the youngest person to fly solo around the world. One of his final stops this week was in Happy Valley Goose Bay, Newfoundland, Labrador. His visit and record-breaking journey is our moment. It's very special to be back in uh, Goose Bay in Labrador. Thank you very much. The journey started on the 23rd of March, um, and so it's been going on for about four and a half months. I got to see quite a lot of the wilderness around Canada, which is amazing. I'd been in planes my whole life. Uh, when, some, when I was about seven, I, I think it's the first time I actually held the controls of an airplane. <laughs> At 10 or 11, I started flying more and more often with my parents, and then it just, it just, my passion grew from there. When I was 15, I got my license to become the youngest pilot in the world at that point. I knew I wanted to do something special in aviation. 
Once my sister flew around the world, I knew that I too also wanted to fly around the world. I'm really enjoying my journey. I really love flying. Uh, so it's, it's going to be a shame to, to stop it. And we should point out he has a special connection in Newfoundland and Labrador. His dad crashed into a mountain in the province and was rescued by people. And, uh, and you know, he, he was fine after that. But uh, for all of that, uh, he decided to, uh, to make sure he did a flyover where his dad was rescued on the way to his next stop, which is Greenland. That is a national for August 19th. I hope you can join me for Cross Country Checkup. On CBC Radio Sunday, our topic is finding jobs and workers in tight labor markets. And I'll be back here Sunday evening. Night.